So this is Roman numeral four, the rise of democracy from 1824 to 1828. Uh, for the most part, this period of time will cover the presidency of John Quincy Adams. I chose the beginning of this slide because it shows you uh, men sitting around a tavern or outside of a tavern, and they're talking about politics of the day. And um, in the 1820s, that was America's favorite pastime to sit around and talk about politics. What we're going to see in this, in this presentation is that America becomes much more democratic which means at this time more white males are going to be able to not only vote in the elections but also partake in the political process and run for office. So we're going to call that the spirit of democracy when um, more and more men, like I said, are able to take part in the democratic process. Um, so for number one, old ideas of deference are fading. Deference means to give respect to your your quote-unquote betters, people who are higher above you in the social status. Um, during the colonial period and um, in the revolution era and all the way through, basically until this point, um, people who were elite, East Coast elite, it was expected that they would be given deference. So if you were a poor farmer from the West um, and you saw one of these rich elite coming towards you, you would have to doff your hat, your hat um, get out of their way, a slight bow, um, call them sir or ma'am. Um, people that are ab above you were supposed to be given more uh, respect. Um, as we get into the 1820s, that idea is starting to fade. For example, today in America, we rarely stand when somebody enters a room. Unless it's a bride or a judge, um, we feel that you know no one is our better and we should have equality and we should be treated that way. And so we start to see that trend of deference going away during this early period. Number two, people want a common man in office. Because deference is fading um, and more and more people are going to be voting, uh, the common man, the, the farmer in the West or in the South, uh, wants somebody who uh, shuns the elite, somebody who seems like they're going to stand up to the elite. They're going to um, promote the, the interests and the ideas of the common man. So politicians are going to more and more and more have to convince people that they're a common man, even and in most cases that they're not, that they're a member of the elite. All right. The reasons why we want a uh, more common man in office and less deference is that we're suspicious of the elite. Um, the elite own, owns the banks, the elite run the government, um, and it seems not very democratic that our hands should be in, our, the government should be in the hands of these people um, who are using the government only for their own benefit. And so we will not vote for anybody who openly says that they're an elite. Um, the days of the Federalist Party are long gone where you could get away with saying you should vote for me because I'm better than you. It says looking for a politician they can identify with. We, we're, since about 90% of the population at this point are farmers, we're going to see political, uh, we're going to see politicians uh, really play up the idea that they're a common man, they're a farmer, that they understand what the farmers want, that they grew up in a backcountry cabin, um, and even, in fact, when most of them are going to grow up in mansions, politicians are going to lie or bend the truth a little bit to, to try to say that, hey, I feel your pain, I'm a common man just like you, and we still see this today. We see, still see politicians going out on the campaign trail, rolling up their sleeves. We see them saying, you know, how much their parents struggled to make a living in America. They understand uh, our problems, um, even if most of the politicians in Congress on the executive branch today are millionaires, they still have to create this idea that they're a common man. Um, we see all of that starting here with the spirit of democracy during the 1820s. Um, so like I said, most common at this time were frontiersmen. They're living in Kentucky, Tennessee, Ohio, um, Mississippi, Alabama, someplace on the frontier of America where we're facing Indian attacks still, um, bad weather, lack of transportation. These are all interests and ideas that the common man wants the politicians to pay attention to. We want an Indian fighter. Um, as we have seen so far in this course, um, as we move further and further west, um, we keep running into Native Americans, um, and whether that be uh, Pontiac or Chief Little Turtle or Tecumseh, every time we move west, we're going to face a new Indian threat. Um, the people on the frontier are going to want the federal government to do something about that. So here we have the most common man of all common men, the man who gives really this era its name. This is Andrew Jackson. Um, and really the 1820s and 30s are going to be called the Jacksonian era. He embodies everything that we, we want in a common man. He grew up on the frontier. 
Um, he was orphaned at an early age. He was a self-made man. Um, he, f of course, we know was an Indian fighter from the War of 1812, where he won notoriety in the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, and then, of course, defeating the British at the Battle of New Orleans makes him famous. Um, he's a hard-fighting, hard-drinking man of the frontier, and we like him for it. And so he's going to be a very popular politician at this time. Number three, Jeffersonian versus Jacksonian democracy. What I want to do right here is kind of do a change over time. When we talked about Jefferson, we talked about him and his revolution of 1800, how he was going to uh, increase the amount of democracy in America. So how is Jacksonian democracy different than that? Well, Jacksonian democracy, as we're going to see on this slide, expands democracy to include all white men. So we have a chart here. It's Jefferson, Jefferson on the left and Jackson on the right. And we're going to talk about how these two eras are different and if there is a change, and if so, how much. So under Jeffersonian democracy, we see that um, from 1801 to 1809, when Jefferson is president, we see that states um, are lowering property requirements uh, for white men to vote so that really most white men can vote if they want to. Jefferson believed in the common man and democracy and that they should have the right to vote. Under Jackson, um, we see a con continuity of that as Jackson also believes that all white men should vote. Um, both of them are in the same party. Jefferson is a Democratic Republican and by the time we get to Jackson, the party is just called Democrats. Um, but they're in the same lineage and so they both think that they're the party of the common man. Jefferson, he, while he believed that the rich, the um, common man should vote, he did firmly believe that only rich, educated, elite men should hold office. He thought that they were the only ones that have enough education to really understand the issues, the constitutional issues, and the political issues of the time. And so while, of course, the common man should vote, he should really leave ruling up to the rich, elite men who have been to Harvard or William and Mary or Yale or some of those East Coast schools. Jackson, on the other hand, he believes that all white men not only should vote, but they should also hold office. And so here we see a big difference between the two and a change over time. Um, Jackson, of course, grew up growing up poor, unlike Jefferson. He believed that the common man should not only vote, but they should also and are capable of holding office. And so he will espouse that belief time and time again during his presidency and his political career, that really the common man should be in control of the White House. Trust elite to run the government well, and we had talked about this with Jefferson, is that really, again, once again, only the elite should be able to run the government. Um, Jackson, of course, believes that um, anybody should be able to be in office, but to keep them from becoming elite, he believes in short terms. So in other words, if you're uh, a common man and you get elected to the presidency or to Congress or to the Senate, um, he believes that you should serve your time and then go back home. This is called the rotation in office idea that you know we constantly have people coming from the common men fresh from their ideas they come to washington dc they serve two terms or six they serve two years or six years depending if they're on the house or the senate and then they go back home and live among the common men um, so that the, we now have a new congressman coming in who freshly understands the the concerns of the people jackson was afraid that if you have long terms if you allow politicians to stay in office for 20, 30 years, they're going to become elite, they're going to become too enamored by the East Coast wealth, um, they're going to be physically far away from the common people back on the frontier, and they won't know what's going on. And so Jackson certainly is coming off as more of a Democrat, and what I mean by that is more power to the people, um, even more strongly than Jefferson. Obviously Jefferson was pro-farmer, we've talked about this before, but Jefferson only believed that farmers are the safest people to have democracy. On election day, if you have a nation full of independent small farmers, only they um, can have the vote. Um, because if you live in a city or you work for a big company, then on election day, your boss can come and say, look, vote this way. And if you don't do it, he'll fire you. And so Jefferson doesn't want that to happen. So he wants small independent farmers to be able to go to on election day and vote their conscience and not have anybody be able to control um, how they vote for one candidate or one issue or another. Jackson is the same way for the same reason. He also is very pro-farmer. That's why it's going to see that the Democratic-Republican 
party, or now as we just call it the Democratic Party, is going to be very popular among Westerners and Southerners because in both of those regions, we see most of the people by far are farmers. When we get to the Northeast, um, as we'll find out in a few notes in the future, the Northeast is rapidly becoming more industrial, more urban, um, a lot less farmers, and so really the Democratic Republican Party, or the Democratic Party as we now call it, is not going to have a lot of support in the Northeast. Jefferson believed in states' rights. What that means is, what that means is that in, if we want to have democracy, we need to have it close to the people, literally and figuratively closer to the people. And so if it's a question of whether we have the federal government have more power way off in Washington, D.C., or if we have your state have more power, he believes the state should have more power because they're more directly controlled by the people. If you live close to your state capital, you can talk to the politicians, you can know what's going on, you can affect change. Um, if, however, we have a strong federal government that has a lot of power far off Washington, D.C., it's very hard to make that change. Uh, and he, Jefferson believes that the government then becomes tyrannical and controlled by elite and control and can take your rights away. Jackson also believes in states' rights, so we see a continuity again um, in these two democratic parties. For the same reason, Jackson is a firm believer in democracy, and he believes that America really is somewhat of a confederation. He does love America. He did fight for it in the War of 1812, but he believes that democracy is better at the state level because it's more in the hands of the common man. So we see that Jefferson is a democratic republican and what that means and we see that Jackson is a part of the Democratic Party. Really, a lot of continuity here, a lot of the similar ideas, because they are, after all, the same party, just um, separated by time. So we've talked about the spirit of, uh, of democracy, Jacksonian democracy, if you will, and what, is, uh, what it really is. Let's talk about what causes it. Why are Americans at this time demanding more control of their government? Why are they demanding not only to be able to have the right to vote, but able to participate in politics? Um, and so what we see here is really this is nothing new. We've seen this going on since the revolution. The revolution, of course, was fought for enlightenment ideas like individual liberty and democracy and freedom. And so America just isn't going to you know, wake up one day and change their basic founding beliefs. And so even still in the 1820s and 30s, we're going to see that Americans firmly believe that their country should be about democracy and liberty. It's just time has passed, and we want to keep expanding that. They see some people having the votes, and the people who were disenfranchised before want the votes now. And so it's just a continuation of the spirit of 76. We're just widening the scope of who gets to participate. Another, the second reason that we see a rise in people's demand for democracy was just the availability of land. During, before the revolution and during the revolution, immediately thereafter, we saw that there were property requirements to vote. You had to have so much land or wealth to show that you were a contributing member of society, a taxpayer, and so you should have a voice, um, and so you had to have a certain amount of wealth. But as we add Louisiana Purchase in 1803, as the War of 1812 gets rid of the Native American threat out west, more and more people are able to, as you can see, move west in the picture. And so having a property requirement just is irrelevant because for the most part, if you're white and male and you want land, you can go get it. Just move out west, chop down some trees, um, buy some really cheap land from the government, and you're a voter. So property requirements are lowered to nothing at this point because it just is not needed. Everybody who wants to vote basically can vote. So we see more and more people voting, which means more and more people want to partake in the political process. Um, and so we see a rise in Jacksonian democracy. The last reason that we see on this slide for the spirit of democracy increasing is that people are more interested in politics now. There are some major issues that are going on in America. Um, of course, the one here is shown as the Missouri Compromise. Whether you're a northerner or a southerner, you are interested in what's going on out west, um, if that land is going to be free or slave. Um, if you're a southerner, you want it to be slave territory so you can bring your slaves out west and start your plantation and make money. If you're a northerner, you want that western territory to be free um, so you don't have to compete with those slave owners for land. If, the, if Missouri becomes, uh, as we had talked about last class, if Missouri becomes a slave state, then that makes it really difficult for northern free farmers to move in because they just don't have enough money to compete with those rich plantation owners to buy up the land. And so these big hot-button political issues are going to create more interest in politics. 
Uh, we saw this when Obama was first elected. Um, there was a high voter turnout for recent American elections because there was a war going on, um, which made people interested in voting. There was, you know, the economy was struggling, which makes people interested in voting. And so whenever we see real significant issues that people want to discuss, um, we see voter turnout going up. And of course, there was in the 1820s with, for the example, Missouri Compromise. Okay, so we've talked about the causes of the Jacksonian democracy and what it is. Let's finish it up by talking about the results of Jacksonian democracy. So how does this change America? Um, it almost sounds like an essay question. How does Jacksonian democracy change us politically? Well, as we talked about on the last slide, voter turnout increases greatly in America for the simple fact that more people can vote, so they do. Um, with property requirements lowered to nothing, um, we see more and more people. And so what you see in, in the picture in Election Day in Philadelphia, this is a typical Election Day. People are waving banners. They're excited about voting for the, maybe the very first time. Um, they come out. It's a holiday atmosphere. People are around discussing the issues, reading newspapers you can see on the left on, that's posted on the, the brick wall of the building. Um, people are very excited about voting. Uh, so we're going to see voter turnout increase. Another result is that we're going to see an end of the era of good feelings. We saw that under the um, we're going we saw that under the era of good feelings we have one political party, but one political party cannot make everybody happy. And especially as we're increasing um, the voters in America, uh, one party is not going to make every person happy, and one party is certainly not going to make every section of America happy. So we're going to see a reemergence of the two-party system. We're not just going to have Democratic Republicans anymore. Now we're going to have really a two-party system reemerge. Next, it says political parties change. Um, as political parties become more and more and more democratic, they're going to actually have to go out and grab your vote. They're going to have to convince you, the common man, that uh, you should vote for them. In the past, um, there wasn't really campaigning or electioneering. Um, there weren't you know, commercials and ads, of course, um, or posters. It was just something that you would talk about in bars and who should I vote for in your local tavern or in your local church. But now political parties, since there's more people voting, they're going to have to go out and get people to vote for them. So as we can see in the picture in the background, you'll see there's a parade, uh, there's a float, and there's a flag right in the middle of the street. Um, and they're trying to drum up support for their political party. And so we're going to see parties gain structure. They have to get some kind of an organized way of getting your votes. Only if they're organized, for example, have a party with a, a president um, who's head of the party who will direct strategy. Um, and then have people who are hired for each neighborhood um, in each city or in each state to try to figure out how we can gain votes from that area. So the more organized the party is, the more they have their act together, the more they're going to go out and get those new votes that we've created. Campaigning, like I said, we're now going to have to campaign, and campaigning just means going out and actively trying to convince people to vote for you. Um, we see this, of course, every October and November in America, where we see those political car those political commercials. I know we get sick of them, but they're trying to get you to, you know, either emotionally, intellectually, uh, vote for their side, or, or at least vote against the other side. So we're going to see people go out. Um, you can see on the left-hand side of the picture again. You can see a man who's in a white robe and he's got his fist in the air. I mean, he is he is giving a speech to people, and of course, people in the audience. There's another person pointing back at him, and you're right or you're wrong. And so we're going to see campaign with bands and slogans and posters to try to get out the vote. Go get people to vote for your party. Next, we're going to see development of platforms. A platform is all the things that your party believes in. Um, in the past, we didn't have to have this because political parties um, were united because they were the same section of the country or they were the same ethnic group or they were the same class. But now we're trying to cast a wide net. We're trying to go get as many voters as possible. And so in this spirit of democracy, we're going to try to tell the people exactly what we believe in as a party um, to get their votes. Look, come vote for us because we believe in X and Y and Z and the other people who believe against it. So you should vote for us. Uh, we still see this today, Republicans and Democrats. If you go online, you can look up their platform and find out exactly what they believe in. And if it's something you believe in, then you join the party or you tend to vote for that party. So this is very democratic. It is the, the elite of the party, whether it's whether they're supposed to be elite, the elite are always running the parties, and they have to prove to you that you should vote for them. That's why they have to write down everything they believe. So all of these things, parties, gain structure, campaigning platform, it's all very democratic where you see these elite run parties who now have to try and go get your vote. 
All right. So as I was talking about, all of these things um, discuss how parties become more democratic. Then we're going to see this thing called King Caucus. King Caucus uh, happened before the age of Jacksonian democracy and to a little bit into it. A caucus is a, a closed door meeting. It's where people who are typically elite, they come together and they decide what the party is going to believe in. They decide who the candidates are going to be. Um, and they're going to decide whether a piece of legislation passes or not. It's all very East Coast elite controlled. And in this new spirit of democracy, we don't want that anymore. All the common men in this picture, they want to have a more of a voice in what's going on. Um, and so they're going to say the King Caucus, this elite closed door meeting where we, you know the elites decide what's going to happen, that has to go away. And we're going to see elections much more open. We're going to see the political process much more transparent. And the common man is going to ha want to have more and more of a say in what goes on. So that gets us to what will contain really most of the rest of this presentation, the presidency of John Quincy Adams, 1825 to 1829. As you may have guessed by the name, John Quincy Adams is the son of John Adams. Um, as you can look at the picture, he is an East Coast elite. Um, he came from a very political family. His father was president. He grew up working for the federal government, being an ambassador um, to four other countries. Um, he, as you remember, he organized the Treaty of Ghent that ended the War of 1812. So this is, when I say right man, um, he, there's probably nobody more qualified to be president in 1825 than John Quincy Adams. He deals with, he's dealt with other countries, like I said. Um, he knows from his father what it's like to be president and all the intricacies that you have to understand and master and work with Congress. And so he probably is a very qualified candidate for being president. However, it's the wrong time. Really, John Quincy Adams, even though technically he's a Democratic Republican because everybody's a Democratic Republican at this time, the era of good feelings is still going on, he really is kind of a closet Federalist. Um, he would be a Federalist if they existed, but they don't. They have ceased to exist because of the War of 1812 and the Hartford Convention. And so he is kind of forced to be in the Democratic-Republican Party because there's just no place for him to go. But he is for East Coast elite. He wants the elite to run America. He's very pro-business, pro-strong government. It's really all of the things that the Federalists believed in he still holds but that's not the spirit of America. At this time, Americans, we have just said, they want much more democracy, they want much more common man control, and he's just a man who's kind of out of step with his time. We can see this in number two, his State of the Union speech. John Quincy Adams, during his State of the Union speech, as all presidents will, they will write a speech or deliver a speech to Congress talking about how the country is doing and what their goals are for the upcoming year. Um, and so one of the things he talks about in his speech is that he wants to have the federal government spend money on internal improvements, roads, bridges, canals, those kinds of things. Now, of course, nowhere in the Constitution does it say that the Congress has the right to do this. Um, so he is going to have to use loose construction, which means more power to the federal government, which is not as democratic as most of the people in America would like at the time. What you see in the picture on the left is the National Road, a road built by the federal government's money, collected from taxes, that we will extend the road from the East Coast to the frontier. This is very popular with Westerners because they want a way to get their crops to market and they want somebody else to pay for it, the federal government. Um, it's not going to be as popular with other sections of the country as we will see. Next, he also wants to promote science. He, after all, is an East Coast elite. He's highly educated, Harvard, um, East Coast school, and so he believes that America should try to improve its science. And so he proposes in his State of the Union speech that um, the American government should pay for uh, science. Uh, we should, what lighthouses at that time, as you can see, means observatories. And so he thinks the federal government should spend tax dollars on observatories to further the knowledge of science. We're going to see that most Americans simply don't care about science at that time. They have other interests at heart. Next, he, he cares about literature. If you can see in the picture, he loves reading. He is an educated man. And so he believes that America should create a national university funded by the taxpayers. And most of the people that will go there are elite. And again, this is not something that the common man cares about or will benefit from. Um, and so we see that he is just out of stuff with his time. He wants to promote things that the elite care about, but not so much the common man. And we already talked about he is a Federalist. 
So his State of the Union speech and John Adams uh, just as a whole is going to be criticized because he's out of touch with most people's needs. So the things that I mentioned on the previous slide, um, that's not going to mean anything to these people on the frontier. We see people living in a log cabin. We see mom and dad and their many uh, children. We see their subsistence farmers. They have to go hunt or fish everything they need. They're cut off from outside society because there's not a lot of roads and bridges. And so when John Quincy Adams talks about having a university or observatories, that's, gonna not, that's not going to make our common man voter here really happy. He's going to wonder, what the heck does this have to do with me, and why should I have increased taxes to pay for all of this? The South is not going to like John Quincy Adams because they're afraid any time of a strong national government. If you remember, most Southerners are Democratic Republicans. Um, from this point going forward, the South is going to have a very particular criticism of strong federal government because they're afraid that a strong federal government will challenge slavery. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but some point in the future. And so the South is hypersensitive to slavery. And if we have a strong federal government that could build national roads, um, you know, promote business, uh, build universities, then what else might that government do? They might get rid of slavery. And so the South, of course, is not going to be a supporter of John Quincy Adams. The West um, is not going to like a lot of John Quincy Adams' plan either because, as you can see in this picture, this guy doesn't have the same interests of Eastern elite. He wants the federal government to do one thing, and that's kill Indians. Um, they are keeping him, he thinks, from settling the land that God wanted him to have, um, and so he wants the government to be active as far as killing Indians, but maybe not building universities. He also wants the government to give him cheap land. He is a farmer, after all, and the cheaper the land, the better, because then he gets in less debt. Um, and then, as we're going to see as a, an, a recurring issue with farmers, he's going to want easy money, sometimes called soft money or fiat money. He wants the government to print paper money, um, which so he can, it's worthless money, so he has an easier time paying off his debts for the land, for his tools, for everything else he went into debt to borrow so he can become a farmer. These are the things Westerners are worried about, interested in, and none of them were addressed in John Quincy Adams' State of the Union speech. Now the North, where John Quincy Adams is from, you think of any region, that region would give him support. However, they're not really excited about John Quincy Adams either because of his internal improvements idea. Now while the West may like internal improvements because they can get their crops to market, the North doesn't like it at all. The reason being is because the easier you make it to, for people to get out West with roads and bridges, the more people will move out West, the more Western states will have. And if we think about the structure of the House of Representatives or the Senate, the more Western states we have, the less the Northeast has a say in what goes on in the government. They become a smaller and smaller section of the country the more states we add. And so the North is upset with internal improvements because it just sees that as the beginning of the end of their control over the United States government. So here we can see what does John Quincy Adams do when he's criticized. Uh, what a politician who believes in democracy might do is listen to the people and say, you have a point, um, I should change my focus. Instead, when he was criticized, Adams says the government should, quote, not fold up our arms and proclaim to the world that we are palsied or crippled by the will of our constituents. In other words, I don't care what the common man says, let the elite rule, they know what's best. Obviously, in this age of increased democracy, John Quincy Adams is going to have a difficult time getting reelected. So, continuing on, the era of good feelings comes to an end. As I mentioned, one of the results of this increased democracy is we're going to see a two-party system reemerge. So what we see in the chart here is the Democratic Republicans. Remember, after the War of 1812, it's the only surviving party, and so everybody was a Democratic Republican. But, of course... John Quincy Adams is not a Democratic Republican, maybe in name, but certainly not in beliefs. So as he's in his presidency and he does his State of the Union speech, it becomes very uh, apparent to everyone that John Quincy Adams wants to promote the elite, to promote business, to increase tariffs, to do all of the things those uh, Federalists who were dead and gone wanted to do before. And so under his administration, we see the Democratic Republican Party split. Um, the people who follow John Quincy Adams are going to be called National Republicans, emphasis on the national, because they want a strong national government. It really is just the Federalist Party resurrected. And then the people who are for more for democratic control, more democracy, more power to the states, less power to the federal government, well, they're going to be called just plain old Democrats. And we see Andrew Jackson is going to emerge as the preeminent 
uh, man who represents these interests. Next, frustration on the frontier. Um, Georgia, by no means uh, the East Coast is the frontier, but the inland is. Georgia, if you remember, was one of was the last colony to be settled. It's got an extremely hot, humid climate, lots of forests, um, and so it's going to be slow in being settled. So northwestern Georgia is the frontier at this point. Um, and of course, we see white people pouring in to the frontier, wanting to have more and more land. The problem is that there are Native Americans still living on that land. Um, and so the people of Georgia put pressure on their own state government to force the Indians to sign a treaty. It's called the Treaty of Indian Springs, 1825. You can see it in the bottom left corner. This treaty was an unfair treaty. Uh, the state government of Georgia, in effect, put a gun to the Native Americans' heads and said, sign this treaty and give up a whole bunch of your land. The Native Americans didn't want to do this, but outgunned and outnumbered, that's the only thing they could do. This would create a problem, though, because the Treaty of Indian Springs um, was signed with one Native American tribe, not all Native American tribes. But for the white people who live in the region, all they know is that the Native Americans said yes to the treaty, um, whether they were forced to or not. And so that must mean that all Indians are OK with this. And this is a recurring problem we see with governments of the United States and Native Americans. Native Americans are divided up into a whole bunch of smaller tribes. Um, and you'd have to have uh, hundreds of treaties with each one of these separate tribes. But white America uh, didn't quite understand at the time, and so they believed one treaty was good for everybody. Um, and so we'll see some Native Americans abide by the treaty, some Native Americans say it wasn't our treaty, and so they'll break the treaty. Um, and so we see lots of disagreements and conflicts result from this. So Native Americans who signed the Treaty of Indian Springs and some who didn't, they believed it was an unfair treaty. And so they cried out for the federal government to pay attention and to help them. So that brings us to um, John Quincy Adams. Now, Creek Indians, because of the treaty, will lose about 4.7 million acres of their land as a result of this treaty. So they, go to John, they do go to John Quincy Adams and they say, John Quincy Adams, help. This was a fraudulent treaty. They made a sign that under duress and not all Native American tribes signed this. And so it's an unfair treaty. Now, of course, the federal, the Constitution gives uh, Congress and the presidency the right to deal with Native Americans, not states. And so there's another reason this treaty is fraudulent. Adams says to Georgia that they signed an unfair treaty, and he tells them that they have to sign a new one, one that's more fair to Native Americans, or just, just let Congress deal with the issue. Georgia, of course, says, no, we're not going to do that. Um, Georgia says, we don't care what you say, um, John Quincy Adams. We are going to take the, the land from the Indians because we want it for our white farmers. And so we have a conflict here between the federal government and states. If John Quincy Adams, who of course says that he is for a strong national government, truly believes that, then he should have sent the army down to deal with this threat from Georgia. But he doesn't. He knows that he doesn't have a lot of support, even within his own party. Um, and so he, lets go, he goes ahead and lets Georgia um, enforce the Treaty of Indian Springs and force the Creek Indians off their land. So we see this recurring trend, and this is a great example of that. Who should have more power, the federal government or the state governments? And while John Quincy Adams says the federal government should, his actions dictate otherwise. Next big issue is the tariff. The tariff is going to be uh, the big issue that ends John Quincy Adams' presidency. It comes right at the end of his time in office. Um, the tariff, if you remember, is a way for the federal government to promote American manufacturing. If we put a tariff on foreign goods, um, then that adds to the price, and Americans are much more likely to buy something made in America which doesn't have the tariff. So we have the vice president of the time. We see him on the left. His name is John C. Calhoun. He'll be a major player in this class until we get to the Civil War. John Quincy Calhoun is a Democratic Republican, and he was the vice president for John Quincy Adams. The problem is, is that John C. Calhoun is a Democratic Republican and now a Democrat. And as we said on a few slides before this, John Quincy Adams is going to split off from the Democratic Republican Party and become a national Republican. And so we have this very uncooperative atmosphere between the president and the vice president. John Quincy Adams is in one party, the National Republican Party, and John C. Calhoun is in another one, the Democratic Party. So these two men certainly do not get along. Now John C. Calhoun, more than anything else in the world, wants to be president of the United States. 
And so he's thinking about what he can do to get his party, the Democrats, and himself elected to office in 1828, the, coming, the upcoming election. And so he decides to use the issue of the tariff. So the tariff of 1828 is created. It's secretly written by John C. Calhoun, the president, who gives it to some of his friends in Congress to propose. It is an extremely high tariff on imports. Uh, now, this is something that John C. Calhoun, of course, personally detests. So why would he write it? Uh, he wrote it because he believed that it's a campaign issue. If he can get Congress to debate the tariff during an election year, 1828, that'll clearly mark a difference between the two parties. Now, once again, nobody knows he wrote this law in secret. And so if you're a Democrat, you can say that this is a horrible tariff, and you can gain supports of all the people in America who hate tariffs, which is mostly farmers. If you say you're for the tariff, then you seem like a radical because the tariff is so high that even people who like tariffs might think that this tariff is way too high. So he was hoping, John C. Calhoun was hoping that the Democrats could use the tariff issue to get elected and not really worry about it passing because nobody in their right mind would vote for a tariff that has such high rates as this one does. So if you're a Democrat, no matter where you are, as I said before, you can say that you're for it if you live in the North, but not have to worry about it passing because it's too ludicrous. And if you're in the South, where people hate the tariff, you can use it to get elected. Vote for me and I will vote against the tariff. Next, we know that the tariff will go down to defeat because, like I said, nobody would vote for this extremely high tariff. And so if this tariff goes down to defeat, not only will the Democrats use it to get elected, but also the whole idea of tariffs may fall to defeat. If this tariff goes down, then future tariffs will as well. And so John C. Calhoun, who hates tariffs, uh, believes that this is a way to get rid of the issue once and for all, have this spectacular defeat for the tariff of 1828, and then nobody will bring up the tariffs ever again. So we see number five, the tariff continued. There was one flaw in John C. Calhoun's plan, is that the Dem National Republicans saw through it. They understand that they, the Democrats really don't want this tariff to pass. They're not worried about it passing. It's just a campaign ploy. And so what they do is they go ahead and pass the tariff, uh, shocking the Democrats. And of course, John C. Calhoun is completely upset by a tariff that he secretly wrote because he never thought it would be passed. Right. The tariff hurts the South economically. We've talked about this for, before, is that the tariff, of course, is going to raise the prices of imports, but also the price of American-made goods. If you're an American manufacturer and you know that the price of your competition just went up, you're going to raise your prices to go up as well, but just underneath the price of the imports. And so as consumers, farmers and Southerners had to pay a lot more. Whether it was barrels or shoes or dresses, now they're going to have to pay more as consumers but it also hurts the South as producers because when we raise a high tariff, all of our European trading partners will do the same thing to punish us. And so now people are not buying American cotton or tobacco. And so the South is once again hurt by the tariff as consumers and producers. The South's economy is starting to crumble. So South Carolina, which is by the way where John C. Calhoun is from, leads the fight against the tariff, but we need to give it some kind of a name we can use to propagandize, and so it is renamed, not the Tariff of 1828, but it is renamed the Tariff of Abominations. Of course, the ironic thing is, is that the person who's going to lead the fight against the tariff is the same man who wrote the tariff. Um, John C. Calhoun will uh, lead the fight against the tariff that he wrote because, again, he didn't think it would ever get passed. South Carolina is going to issue the South Carolina Exposition. In the South Carolina Exposition is a statement written by John C. Calhoun that said that the tariff is unconstitutional, that nowhere in the federal, gov federal government's constitution does it say that they can pass a tariff this high. It is much too damaging to the entire South and the West and their economy, so it's unconstitutional. He also says in the South Carolina Exposition, not that the states will nullify the tariff, but that they could nullify the tariff, which means if this happens that the tariff will not be paid in South Carolina or in any other state. Of course, this brings up the whole issue of state power versus federal 
rights. Um, will states be able to nullify a law that the Congress passes? If this happens, then we allow the co Congress to have actually no power. If a state can just go ahead and say, we're not going to follow that law, then we're kind of back to the Articles of Confederation, where the states could say no anytime the federal government wanted to do something. And so this becomes an issue of states' rights. Is it a state's right to say no to any federal law? Now, once again, the South Carolina, ex the South Carolina Exposition is not saying we will nullify. It's just laying it out there that we could. If you remember, we saw this previously under the presidency of John Adams um, with the Alien and Sedition Acts. Um, Virginia and Kentucky passed the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions that says nullif nullification is valid and states could nullify a law they don't like. So this issue keeps coming up, states' rights versus federal power. Calhoun believes that uh, not only is the, the tariff ruinous of the South's economy, but he also thinks that, this, that nullification is the only way to keep the country together. So this is a little bit of tricky logic, so see if you can follow. He believes that in a country that is increasingly having various sections, north, south, and west, there is no way ever in the future that one government is going to be able to pass laws that all three sections like, and eventually the union will split up. To keep that from happening, because Calhoun does love America, after all, he does want to be its president someday, he says that nullification is the only way to keep the union together. If you allow some sections or states to say no to a law that doesn't benefit them, then they're able to keep the country together. You, we can simply say in the South, well, you in the North can have the tariff, but not us in the South, and we can all live in peace and harmony. Problem is that that means that the federal government has absolutely almost, well, no power. So what we see, the South Carolina tariff issue is an example of sectional versus na sectionalism versus nationalism. What is going to win out in America? Are sections of countries going to win or are we going to have truly one large government with lots of power and lots of support? Put it another way, states' rights versus federal power.